to turn on the recording. Okay, so it's wonderful to, to see every one of you again. Uh, every so often we've been attending uh, a church about 10 minutes away from our house. Uh, it's called the Dobbins Church. I think I mentioned it last time. And uh, they, it is a very young church. It has only 10 people at, at most on the Sabbath. They are mostly new people. I, I would say almost all of them are new, except the head elder who's there, who does everything. He's been trying, he's been trying to revive that church and make it um, evangelize the area. So we've been going there every once in a while, pray with them, support during Sabbath school. <laughs> So pray for them. The uh, head elder's name is John Fleming. He, uh, there's no pastor there. You know, some of these rural churches don't have pastors because they probably don't have a, you know, I don't know what it is, uh, but uh, that's what we, we learned. That that's how it has been working. So I would like to, uh, I, I would like to ask for your prayers on behalf of the church so that uh it would grow and the members would grow, even spiritually. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about even today as we get into the sermon, uh, whose title is Where Your Strength Lies. Where Your Strength Lies. Even as I get into that, um, I want you to think about uh, people that are held in high regard especially if they are celebrities or people of renown. Uh, it's interesting that only up to lately, uh, you know, certain people, and without mentioning specific names because they are human beings, uh, were held in very high regard, almost, in, uh, you know, they had almost like a godlike presence because they, were, they, they, they have special abilities, either they are actors, they are sports people, or they're even um, uh, intellectual uh, giants. But what's interesting that is uh, that I've noticed in every tr trend, a, a trend that's been um, manifesting itself lately is that every so many years, someone that was thought highly of seems to fall. And uh, when they, and the bigger they are, the harder they fall when a big story breaks and, and, and reveals their weaknesses. True, the weakness may be true or not, but we know that not all, obviously many of them would be true. And the problem with this situation is that we become so shocked and people say, well, he had such a good image. Why is it that they had such a good image? Well, true, they, had a, they have a special gift. They have a strength and they have a strength, but then there's also PR efforts you know, endorsements or uh, people behind them that portray us an image about that particular person that we all don't know who they are uh, in, real, in the real sense. And so what happens is over time that goes on for a long time, then eventually some story breaks and, 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 and we start to see uh, another picture other than that which we have thought of. And you can look at every human being, no matter how talented, because we like to put talent on a pedestal, no matter how talented or no matter how in, uh, uh, intelligent the person is, that they, you're sure to find uh, uh, some kind of great witness, weakness, especially if they are not grounded in of the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one that's able to keep you from falling. He can't keep you from falling. But without him, there is no strength. And so I just wanted to kind of uh, use that as an introduction and to let it, uh, every one of us know that our strength lies in Christ and lies in the God of heaven. So I wanted us to have a word of prayer so that this may mean something to us. Uh, even as we share this, uh, I share some of the words that God has given me. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for giving us a wonderful opportunity to be able to understand what you have for us in these last days. Father, we know that there's many things happening. 
situations all around us uh, that suggest that uh, the worst is on its way and we need you more than ever. I pray, Father, that all of us would uh, have, will self-inflect and uh, think about what, uh, self-reflect and think about how we can join our strength with yours so that we may be successful, that we may not be fearful, and that we may not fall un un uh, un unnecessarily because we have left your side. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us in everything that we do, and I pray for your Holy Spirit to guide me, even as I break the bread of life to your people and even to myself. In the name of Jesus Christ, we will pray. Amen. Amen. Um, you can't help, but by the way, I, I did give, I, I, I'll have to admit one weakness here. Um, we did give, uh, I did give uh, Jason a scripture reading, uh, but I, I, know, I know they did it wrong. He read from four to nine. Uh, nine. I'm going to read I, uh, Psalms chapter 145, 145, starting with verse 14. 14, because this is this is the topic. It was my mistake, Jason. It wasn't yours. So the, the Lord upholdeth all that fall and raises up all that be bowed down. The eyes of all who wait upon thee and thou, thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. And then verse 18 is the theme. The Lord is nigh unto them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. So you find that he's the one that upholds us in difficult times. Why this topic? Why now? Why why talk about where your strength lies? Well, look around you. Why not? Uh, there's a lot of people, and we've seen many situations where people are getting sick. Those who you think are healthy may, may be healthy, maybe not. And all of a sudden, they get ill and so certain things happen. We've been seeing that. Uh, we know that there are so many things, uh, well, for instance, there's people who are getting vaccines and we think, oh, that's the, that's the panacea, that's the sol solution to the problem. They get it. And then we hear someone saying, let's pray for so-and-so. They had the vaccine and now they're having problems. So we don't, we, even though we have a lot of people in authority saying you need to do this and this is what happens and I've studied this for years. The funny thing is nobody's willing to admit that they don't know all that needs to be known about what's happening and what will happen. And, they, and it's, 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 it's funny that people who are intelligent and in authority lack humility. But what we start to see is that only our God can save us, you know? But when you think about strength, you know, going back to the Bible, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you, I didn't remind you of the story of Samson. It's interesting. The story of Samson talks about his physical strength. The Bible is, is written in such a way that if you don't meditate upon it, it, it will be just another story. So he's, it's written about his strength being in his hair, for instance. Uh, and then you find that that's taken away. Uh, why is it taken away? Because the book of Proverbs admonishes. What, my son, in Proverbs 31, uh, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows, that's reading from verse 2, give not thy strength unto women, right? Not thy ways unto that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine. Do you know you're, you're a king or a queen because you're a son of the king, right? It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget thy law and pervert thy judgment of any of the afflicted. 
Give strong drink to him that is ready to perish. And wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. So, uh, so you find that Samson's weakness, even though he was strong physically, he had a, a special talent. He was very strong physically, but his weakness was women. To another, it may be drinking, getting intoxicated in whatever form, right? So you find that uh, the Bible uses certain allegories to teach us that, hey, he's a very strong man who's really not strong. You get that? He's a very strong man who's really not strong, right? And one of the problems with Samson being the, the strongest man we've ever heard of is that he was overconfident, overconfident in his abilities. So uh, today's warning is, what do you think you know too much of? What do you think you have control over that you think that, oh, I've got this. I'm good at this. I'm a I'm good orator. I'm a good person. I, I know how to, in my, my, in my workplace, I'm, I'm, I'm the person that, the go-to person. We have to be watchful of that. Uh, and what are your weaknesses? I think that should be the first uh, assessment that we have of ourselves, right? So you find uh, that overconfidence is, is, is something that we have to watch against. Uh, and then there's, the, and, and that's, a, that's called assumption because you have always done certain things and you have a, a, a reputation or experience in doing certain things that you're going to be able to overcome a, situa a certain situation. We just talked about what's been happening to a lot of people getting ill and, and, and we know that these situations will manifest themselves in many other forms. So overconfidence is, a, is another problem. And then we have uh, something called presumption. Just because God has helped, has helped me in a situation before, no matter what I do or say, um, I just have to call on him and he will deliver me. So now you're presuming on God's strength without first checking all the boxes. Now, many people usually go to uh, Romans chapter 10, and maybe we can go there. And that's one of the things that can cause us problems as Christians, because I'm speaking to Christians. Romans chapter 10, I need to go there. I hadn't meant to do it, but if you can go there, you can look at that. Romans chapter 10. And many people like to quote verse 13, right there. Whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. But the sister text is found in Psalms 145, of verses 18. If you read one section of the Bible and not understand that it, there's more to it than what you actually see, then you're mistaken because it says, the Lord is nigh unto them that call upon him. The same wording, calling upon him. But then what is this calling upon him? The scripture in verse 18 of Psalms 145 says, to all that call upon him in truth. Whenever great men of the Bible, great because they were faith, they, they put their faith in God, called upon God, they brought to him facts that he has said, things that he had done, and what he had promised. Hezekiah did that. Uh, Daniel did that. Many others did that. David did that. He they did that. So that you have to understand, you have to call upon God in truth. Don't just make presumptions. Oh, God's going to do this for me, and He's how He's going to do it for me. And then when He doesn't, because you missed a few cues and did some things the way you shouldn't have done them, then He just steps, but He stands back, and then you're wondering why didn't God come through for me? You're putting, you, you've got to understand how, to, how God's strength works because we're putting our hand in his hand. Strength, strength. And by the way, I was going to use this maybe toward the end, but think about it. 
there's a man called Joshua who followed Moses. Moses was one man who put his hand in his trust or his strength in God's hands. We're talking about where your strength lies. He did what God asked him to do, but the people gave Moses a hard time. And Joshua was among those people, not the one, he wasn't among those giving the hard time, but he saw the people that gave Moses a hard time and they disobeyed God. And he saw all that. Yet God tells him, be what? Strong. Joshua chapter one. Maybe we should go there. Joshua chapter one. Be strong and be courageous. Comes after Deuteronomy. I'll wait for you to get there because it's important. You can start with verse 5. It says, uh, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. Notice God is making a promise to Joshua, being the new leader. Uh, As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. It's interesting. Strength. Strength in the Bible is, 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 is paired with courage, true strength. Outside the Bible in our world, people who don't have strength, who seem to have strength, lack the second, courage. Courage to do the right thing. Huh? Be strong and be of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide one inheritance, the land. Hey, standing for truth isn't very easy most of the time, because many people will challenge you. Understand that. And we, in order for us to be the, the children that God wants us to be, we need to be people who say, I, I stand with you, God, and uh, I'm going to follow you no matter what happens. And I know that I'm going to have to suffer some losses because of some of the things that I stand for. Do you see that? He is the man who was meant to subdivide the land. I don't know which man said that uh, there's a group of, uh, of people, I think the tribe of Joseph, that complained that they didn't get enough land. And Joshua said, since you guys are great people, why don't you go, go ahead and, 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 and fight off those those, those, those uh, Hittites or some tights out there and do it. So he had to have some courage. You know, he wasn't going to just be someone who's easily moved from place to place. A man who are godly ought to be men of courage and, and integrity and, and stamina and, 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 and not move, not vacillate. Be, a str- str- be a strong, be strong and of good courage for unto this people shall thou divide the inheritance of the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou may be able, the mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithsoever that thou goest. So you notice that, that strength means that you have been, you have to be grounded and rooted in what God says. We have to establish that strength is not what you think it is. What what uh, Samson had was physical strength, but he lacked strength because he didn't do the things that God asked him to do at this specific time. Now I'm going to also share something else with you. There's a few characters that seem to meet the same kind of criteria that Samson had. I'll give you one. Go to Cain. Cain seemed like he knew what to do. He knew how to cultivate the land. He knew how to do different things. But when it came to do what God wanted him to do, he um, he did not do what God wanted him to do. Even though he knew what the instructions were. And this is what we're told by Pen of Inspiration that the problem with this kind of religion, 
which it unfortunately has found its way into the church, is like, oh, you guys decide to follow the Bible this way. I choose to follow this and that. And those two groups will be there until the end of time. And then we will see which one can be able to stand or will meet God's approval. Because you want to follow that which is good for you. Or uh, you want to follow a religion that seems to mirror someone else's, not the one that's in the Bible. You have to be careful with that. That's presumption. So you find Cain doing that. He's, he's presuming that, well, you know, does God just wants a sacrifice, so I'll give him what I want. Then God says, no, that's not what I want. And, he, and because of that, something happens there that I want us to take note of. These characters in the Bible, when they decide to use their own strength and become free spirits doing what they choose to do, choose to do, other than what God is asking them to do, a transformation happens. And you're going to see that. Try and look at these characters throughout the Bible. A transformation happens to where something good doesn't follow. Number one, when Cain decided that he wasn't going to do what God did, wanted, and wanted to do what he wanted, guess what happened? He switched allegiances unbeknownst to him. Whenever you start opposing, you notice know people in the, in the church or even in the, in the society, people who uh, um, well, maybe walking a steady walk and then all of a sudden they decide to change course for something that doesn't seem uh, uh, very palatable, something that is against human decency. They are not just satisfied to maintain their positions, they do something drastic. Number one, here is what Cain did. He killed his brother. You may say, well, uh, that seems like uh, you know, an oddity. Okay, go, go to someone like um, Esau. Esau, he liked living the free life and he likes to live and get what he wanted now. When he sold his birthright and, and the enemy does that to us, when, they, when they, he sold his birthright, he turns around and all of a sudden, he then realizes that he, he was short-sighted and nearsighted, and then he creates an, an enmity between himself and his brother. And what happens to him after that? He becomes a, 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 a murderous person. You read the book of Genesis, the account of, of, of Esau. He, he, it's, he said his sword was against every man. That's what he did. He became a murderous kind of person. He was like, he led a group of bandits. That's what he did. That's what happened. You go down the road in any other person that, that acts like, oh, I don't like to listen to rules and regulations or organized religion and people throw out things like that. Whenever you have that kind of spirit, this is what Satan makes you think. You're on your own, but you're not. You're just switching allegiances. Because when, what you do after that with your life and some of the things, the choices you make will tell you that you're not in God's strength. You have abandoned that. But Satan, because he is a deceiver, he tells you, do, you can do things on your own. You'll be freer. But then he inserts himself in there and causes you to, he controls you. Where does your strength lie? With God or with the other man? Now, let's look at some other story now. I wanted us to start with 1 Samuel chapter 13. And this is an interesting story. 1 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, to set the backdrop for this story, uh, Saul has just become king. And you have heard this story before. And I'm going to pick it up somewhere in verse 5. Um, and I want you to understand that he is a man who was chosen by the people. The Israelites chose him as king because his head and shoulders were above everybody else. He had the posture of a king. He wasn't quite, uh, he, he, was, he had all the physical attributes that you would find as a strength in this world. 
but then now something is exposed here. But I want us to uh, understand how this whole situation unfolded. When I read this story, I've often questioned myself. Okay, this guy seems like he was doing the right thing. He tried to, uh, to handle things the right way, but yet he seems to have been faulted. And this was one of his first mistakes. And that's what led to his downfall. So in verse five, if you can turn there, first uh, Samuel chapter 13, giving you some time to get there, uh, starting with verse five, um, we're gonna look at that. Man is in a desperate situation. The Philistines, the Philistines, and the Philistines, that's what it says. First Samuel chapter 13, verse 5. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots, 600 horsemen, and people as the sand on which the seashore in multitude, and they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward of, of uh, Beth Hay. Uh, I don't know if you've been reading these stories and most of your children are, have doing, been reading, and I'm pretty sure if you, you haven't read this, you will go back and read it. But you notice that if you look at this situation, it's precarious. This will have a lot of ammunition. It's kind of like the times that we're living in. Uh, one of the things about uh, uh, granting a sermon is always asking yourself, even as we pray, Lord, even as I present this story, uh, why should the person listening to it care? Well, and how does it relate to them? I can read the story, but if it doesn't have any relationship with your life, then it doesn't mean anything. Obviously, I believe you've prayed, and so the Lord's probably speaking to you in some kind of way. Uh, but I, I, I submit to you that sometimes in this life, and this is how the enemy works, he always makes you think that you are at a disadvantage. He did that with Adam, and that's what he does to get you to cross over. Now, look at the, look at the people, man. You, you can't handle this. If you, if you read the story of the Israelites, especially at around this time, uh, and go back, they had seen quite a few times, and they didn't have blacksmiths in their midst. They didn't have chariots. They didn't have spears. Only Jonathan and, and, and Saul had spears. And then you have chariots filling the land all of a sudden, all throughout the land. Now you have 30,000 chariots. And you don't even have one carrier. Maybe Saul has one, and maybe Jonathan has one. Uh, and, and this is the situation that will befall us even as we come closer to the end of time. But obviously, hoping that you have read the story of Elisha, and uh, they must have heard, uh, heard about Elisha during this time. Uh, well, I don't think they had, because this was very early in, in, in the ministry of Samuel. Uh, and, and Elisha had not become a prophet. But later on, we have heard about Elisha and the chariots of fire that protected him. Um, and so you can see how this man would have said, wow, they've got all these people. And when the people, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits because they are looking at their own strength. And maybe you have a situation in your life where you're looking at your own strength and, and maybe some situation will happen at work later where they say so many people who don't do this and don't do that, we can't have them. And, and, you're, and you're panicking and you're thinking, how am I gonna pay my rent or what am I gonna do? Or maybe I need, you know, this is what the Lord wants me right now and I don't know how I can get there. So you're looking at your strength and, and the kind of things that you can do. Okay? And so what happens? And some of the Hebrews went over to the Jordan and to the land of Gad and Gilead. Some people fled. And as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and the people followed him trembling. So now he's in a situation, maybe if you are a parent where your children need certain things and you're 
They're in a situation and you're thinking, what shall I do? And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. So what did Saul do? Something he was not supposed to do. He thought, man, let's get this over with quickly. Kind of like you do when you're thinking, okay, I have a problem here. How, what can I do to fix it? Uh, I, I do whatever it takes because I need to get this problem out of my hair. And I'm going to do it according to what I know. I, I, I mean, there's no time to pray here. It's just too difficult right now. Let me do it. Right? That's what happens. Somebody, so, hey, John. Yes, yes. Somebody needs to mute themselves. Yeah, we just have a kid that's uh, a little distressed. No, no, there's another phone. Oh, okay, I see that. Yeah, there's a phone. Another, not yours. Somebody else's is. Okay. No, they can. Hear. Yeah, they can hear it sound. Okay, I think it's going to come down in a little bit. So, um, yeah. So what happened was uh, they. Uh, Oh, there's a phone. Okay, just hang on. I see what you mean. Oh, there you go. How about now? Is it better? Much better. Okay, so, so now you find that there's trembling. There's fear. Okay? Uh, and then all of a sudden, out of fear, Saul does what he shouldn't have done. And he offers a sacrifice himself, the work that was meant for Samuel, the prophet, and that was not his role. And he goes ahead and does that. And then as soon as he does that, then Samuel shows up. And I often ask myself, why, why, you know, Samuel seems to have been, I mean, late and, and certain things, but that's how God works sometimes. He wants to know if you're gonna trust him no matter what. He wants to know if you'll trust him no matter what. But then he also doesn't expect you to trust him without evidence of something else, of him, him helping you before. So I, 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 I was reading this sometime and I couldn't help but remember reading somewhere that this situation was, was, um, was similar, I believe in chapter seven, you find something very similar. This is, I, I just read to you chapter 13. In chapter seven, before Saul became king, Saul became king and pray, be prayerful saints. I think this is important. I, I see something happening here. Uh, in chapter seven, the same thing happened where they were under attack. And maybe I can go back to verse seven. Um, chapter seven. that one time uh, Samuel had gathered the Israelites. This, by this time, they didn't have a king. This is in chapter seven. He had gathered the Israelites in a place called Mitzpah. And I looked up the, the meaning of that name. This is after the ark came home. You know, this is after the ark came home. And uh, they were gathered there. And the Philistines, the Philistines heard that they were there. And in verse 7, it says, And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together to Mispah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. That means they are getting ready to offer a sacrifice to the God of heaven. And before they are ready to even do that, the, the Philistines say, let's strike now. See, the enemy doesn't give you an opportunity. Right now, I'm pretty sure none of you knew COVID would struck, uh, strike. But God knew. And then all of a sudden, before you can organize yourself, figure out what to do, these people are upon you. And then all of a sudden, what happens? And the children of Israel say to Samuel, cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a sucking lamb. Imagine that these guys are almost attacking. And now here Samuel is slowly taking a, a lamb, offering it as a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord of Israel, and the Lord heard him. I want us to note something here. He didn't stop. 
he didn't stop praying because he knew that's where their strength lied. And then in verse 10, it says, and as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, which Saul in chapter uh, 13 was rushing to get through so that they can get to be fighting, you know, because he thought, wow, we got to get protect ourselves. He was rushing to do that. Saul didn't stop because he recognized where his strength was. He didn't stop. This was before the, the situation in chapter 13. And Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. So now, having that background now, don't you think you would think differently when reading chapter 13? If Saul was alive at the time, he wasn't king, but he knew about what happened in, in Mitzpah. And from that place, that time, they call that place Ebenezer, you know, because that's where God helped them. How could they forget Ebenezer? Now, let me ask you a question. If you're faced with a situation, and this is one area, you're faced with a situation. Do you forget what God has done? He's your strength. You know, he's your strength. And you can even go back to, to times when they crossed the Jordan and when they had to sing all around Jericho and Jericho fell. He's your strength. It's not how many swords or how, many, how much education you have or, or what you can do or how much money you have to get where you're going. That's not how God works. He's your strength. It's not you. It's not your strength. That's not how he works. And so sometimes the, one of the biggest problems we're having today is you, you're faced with challenges all throughout the day and, and you're rushing that, that worship, morning worship. You're rushing it. You don't tarry long enough. You don't, you don't want to sit there and, and do that. You're rushing it. And that's where your strength lies. Your strength lies. So, you know, that, that, that's the problem with, with, with us. And, and we need this kind of, we need a strength that we do not have. You know, we have, we don't, we don't have chariots. We don't have the ammunition that the world has. But that's not what we need. Remember, with, 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 in the story of Gideon, he told them, he had a couple thousand people. He told them, these people are too many. Send them back. Send them back. But these, uh, there's a good line to this, though. Uh, children, God's children will face challenges. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Elder George preached about Ruth. She went to the land of the enemy begging for food or getting so that she, they can get food. She came back without children. Let me tell you something. The simple fact that you've fallen a couple of times, uh, you've failed in strength, uh, and, and have no, you don't feel like you have any strength, doesn't necessarily mean that God can't give you strength. Even Samson, even though he fell because he united with the wrong kind of people and gave his strength to women, at the very end, God gave him strength. And, and, we, and, we, and you can remember Jesus saying uh, that it is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven maimed. If you've fallen, it's, it's not late. If you're listening to this sermon, there's going to be repercussions for your the choices you've made to take this, your strength away because you, you, you sided with, this, with Satan from, for, for a point, but you can return to the Lord even now. Even now you can do it. You think about it. What is failure to humankind may be even a starting point for God. If the story of Abraham doesn't teach you anything, a man who is 99 years old, who hasn't had children, where God says you're going to have them, and it became a beginning of a gener many generations of many people that will come through him, why are you looking at one situation and thinking, I got to fix this, I got to do this this way in your own strength? You know what God likes? He likes faint people. He likes people who recognize that even though you can fix problems and seemingly look like you have some strength over a certain situation over time, that you've only done a temporal thing. But when God fixes things, he's thinking about eternity. Think about that. Uh, and I got to read Isaiah chapter 40, 40 because it's, it's in this context. 
Are you, are you faced in a, in a situation where you feel like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to uh, uh, sustain this situation, uh, in living the right way and, and asking and, and, and still sticking to my God? Uh, am I gonna stick to it? And notice what he says in verse 29 in this context. Because he, when, when we compare ourselves to God, we're weak. And God is not looking for people who are strong according to this world, but are strong because we have united our strength with his. So he says in verse 29, he giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Hmm. Hmm. Ponder that for a minute. He increases strength. You know, uh, this is another sermon for another day, but I was just thinking about, and I was sharing this with a few friends, and I said, remember the man called Bezalel, the man that built the Ark of the Covenant? Uh, we were reading this uh, Conflict and Courage, uh, and it talked about the man Bezalel. When they left Egypt, they left Egypt as slaves. And amongst the, the people that left Egypt, there were some who were called the mixed multitude, that means the Egyptians, who were in charge of great exploits and building large buildings and different things, but God did not choose them, right? And uh, Moses was gifted with uh, the, the gift of leadership and he had been brought up in Pharaoh's courts, but he did not have him uh, build the ark. But however, he picked a man called Bezalel, whom we had not heard of up to this point. And this man, Bezalel, did not know how to handcraft things and do things the right way. I wish I had a picture. There's something I wanted to show you. And uh, oftentimes, we think that we have to have experience or some people have to be in our midst for us to be able to accomplish certain things. But this man, according to what God told Moses, is that this man had his spirit within him. And he says, he's the man that I have chosen. And he has an assistant called the Holy App. And so when I, the more I thought about uh, Bezalel, and one time I moved out here, we, when we moved out here, uh, they brought this shed and I didn't realize that they don't put a, um, a ramp to it and so that I could get my things in there. And I said, Lord, I've never built a ramp. And I said to myself, Lord, how am I going to get the strength to build this? I can't get Alvin over here or George over here. Uh, so I'm in trouble. And I don't want to pay for it either. <laughs> and I said, Lord, Lord God of Bezalel, help me learn how to put this thing together. And so I, 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 I sat there and I went to YouTube. I looked at some videos and I thought, oh, I got it. And so I went in and I got the wood from Home Depot. And I laid it out like they said you laid out. And, the, and I, when I had done everything that they said do, and I put the ramp, it didn't look like a ramp. This is the part I didn't tell you, George. I, it didn't look like a ramp. And I said, God of Bezalel, I mean, I've spent, already spent some money on this now. Um, uh, you know, Bezalel was a slave. He didn't know how to build the ark, but he gave him the wisdom. And as I was standing there, the Lord showed me, you don't need all those measurements. You see that wood right there? It needs to be cut a certain way. And I thought, you know what? They did say that, but let me try it. And once you cut that one, it will be the template for the rest of them. And that's why, that's why it's hugging the ground at the wrong place. But if you cut it, so I put it up on the plane. I hadn't even used the, 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 what, the tool that I, that I was using. And I, somehow I cut it. When I looked at it, my eyes were this wide. Because I thought, wow, it, it looks like it, it might work. So I went and put it down and it, it worked. And so I cut the rest of them real quickly because I thought, wow, this looks like the God of Bezalel is answering my prayer. He's giving me strength that I, and, 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 and skills that I never had. And I put it together. And right now, I wish I could show you a picture. You know, to some people, that's nothing. But to me, that's a Bezalel moment. Uh, uh, something that God gave me a strength to do. Now, I thought to myself, even as I was meditating, I thought to myself, how many times do we sidestep God's opportunity to give us the strength that we need in every situation in our lives, simply because we're looking at world strength, we're looking at our strength, 
and we're not looking to him to give us wisdom. How many times? And especially right now when we're looking at situations falling apart and we have men who are on the, in the media all the time, they seem like they know everything, but they don't know anything. You know, one of the things that I wanted to mention to you, even in closing, understand, understand that these different levels, even in our world, these people who build things, there's people who study things that others have built. You understand? In closing, there's people who build things, and then there's people who know how to fix things that others have built. For instance, if you went and bought uh, a, you know, a Ford, whatever, Ford 150 or whatever car that they, Ford makes, um, there's very many people who know how to fix them. But there are times, you know, there are times you know, when, when Frank was younger, we'd buy all these little helicopters and I would take them to the, to the I'll take it back to the mall and they'd fix it. And then after some time, some parts would go off and they wouldn't work very well. And I'd take it back to the mall because it was still under warranty. And then the guy who was out there, he would think, but then at one point he told me, wait a minute, he messed up this part. I can't help you here. So what do I do now? And you said, it's under warranty. He said, oh no. You need to ship that back to the manufacturer. Are you following me? You need to ship that back to the manufacturer. I, I don't have the parts or that kind of thing. You, you need to ship it back. And I thought, ship it back? That's, that sounds like a lot. But I, I, I thought, OK, forget it. And, and in the same situation, you have people who are manufacturers. Ford is a manufacturer. Then you have mechanics. People who study how to fix the manufacturer's product. And let me tell you something. Let me ask you a question, rhetorical. Who do you have more respect for, the manufacturer or the mechanic? Because that's the problem that we have in our world today. The mechanics talk a lot. And they just study something that God has made. They made the human body and all that. And, and God has a place for them because mechanics know how to fix things and we need them. But they're looking at what has been made and there's more to that which has been made because there's a spiritual aspect and all kinds of other areas that God knows about that they don't know about. He's the manufacturer. Why do we get so impressed? And everybody keeps saying, let's talk about science, science. He's science. He created science. Why do we get all caught up with the mechanics? Mechanics. Let's unite our strength with his strength. There are things that will come upon this earth that the mechanics don't even know what's going on. Yet they'll go out there and start talking and yik yakking, you know, on every show and every show, right? I, I'm not saying that they don't have a role and they have to be respected, but if they get off track, off the tracks, we go back to the manufacturer. And we ask him to help us. But if we don't spend time with him, uh, we, we get all panicky based on what we are seeing around us. Guess what? We're losing faith in him. And we're going to make Saul's mistake. We're going to make Samson's mistake. We're gonna, uh, and then we're going to switch. We're going to uh, switch our, our, our allegiances without our knowledge. And the Lord is saying, I am your strength. Amen. I am your strength. I want you to unite your strength with my strength because the times that are coming, nobody knows how to deal with these things. There's a great controversy happening. It is not going to be solved with what you think or how many, how many years of schooling you've had or this kind of thing. None of that. No. No. And so with heads bowed, eyes closed, Father, in heaven, I have delivered the message that you gave to me to share with your people because they need your strength as I need it. And uh, we don't want to fail because we are looking to others or looking to others to deliver us or looking for, to others to help us make good decisions. And Father, one of the things that we know is that whenever you ask people to do things, 
you do not put fear in their heart. Where there's fear, there's no love and there's no trust. And where we are being asked to make decisions based on fear is something that the enemy likes to use a lot. We pray, Father, that we would unite our strength with yours. Help us to spend more time with you. Uh, give us time for worship. Help us not to be uh, make assumptions about what you're going to say yes to or no, but to seek you and to seek your face. Help us not to be presumptuous about uh, what you will help us with when we're doing what we ought not to be doing. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would be with us and strengthen us and forgive us where we've sinned. Because when we've sinned, then the enemy uh, is able to attack us just like when Balaam caused uh, your people to fall. That's when he was able to curse them. So, and, and Father, I pray, Lord, that you would be with us so that we are not falling prey to the enemy's uh, wiles, that we may be able to stand with you all the time and that you would be our strength and not ourselves or the enemy trying to come between us and you. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, John, for the message. Praise <laughs> God. Amen, Uncle John. Amen. Thank you.